Welcome everybody to Inspiration and Adaptation, a weekly dialogue exploring how Alaska artists are innovating and adapting in times of planetary stress, social unrest, and pandemic. I'm Asia Freeman, Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Art Center. Bunnell is situated within the lands of Nichiltana, Nindilchik village tribe, whose descendants trace their roots from the ancient Kechemak peoples and the Dena'ina and Sukpiak people of this region who have sustained these lands since time immemorial. Benel is committed to resisting colonialism by partnering with indigenous artists and supporting indigenous led practices. So what does it mean to create new music with respect for indigenous cultures, peoples, land, stories, and experiences? I'm here today with Found, Found Nations, Christopher Marinetti and Joe Bergen of Mantra Percussion as well as Katie Cox and Andy Tanning from Wild Shore New Music. I want to welcome you all and to our many guests joining us across this land called the United States today. Let's begin with some self-introductions of our featured guests. I'm going to invite Katie and Andy to begin. Benel has been so pleased to support your work as Alaska-raised musicians living in New York for the long term. Um, and then invite Chris and Joe to um, introduce themselves. Katie, would you start by orienting us briefly to the history and mission of Wild Shore? And then Andy, perhaps you could follow up with an orientation to how Wild Shore became connected to Found Sound Nation, and then we'll move into, you know, our, our additional project partners here. Thank you so much. Well, absolutely. Thank you, Asia, and thanks for having us. And it's nice to see so many familiar faces and names uh, um, here today. Um, yeah, so Wild Shore, you know, we've, we, we, we came up with the idea, I, it's been about 10 years ago, which is just blows my mind. Um, uh, Andy and I were, you know, just found ourselves, I think at this time in our lives where we really wanted to kind of come back to our roots and come back to Alaska. And we started this project with Conrad Winslow, um, composer who's originally from Homer. And um, at the time, we started just meeting actually virtually. <laughs> I lived in Los Angeles at the time, um, and and made connections with uh, Asia Freeman at Benel, and wanted to. We were just really hungry to come back and share our music that we had been making for the last, um, you know, several years of being once we left Alaska to come back and share contemporary chamber music that we were really excited to play and we've now had about seven seasons um in in homer and we've also played concerts in kenai and talkeetna and anchorage and we've had a couple other side projects we've done in washington dc and new york so um that's kind of the the history of wild shore um for the last 10 years Wonderful, and thank you, Katie. Andy, tell us a little bit about how um, Wild Shore became connected to this incredible, um, big, and long-term project with Bound Sound Nation and Youth Mantra Percussion. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I guess a few, yeah, a few years before Wild Shore started. Um, I had moved to New York City and attended graduate school in violin performance, and I was looking for, I don't know, something different to do with the violin other than um, classical music. Um, and through kind of exploring different uh, musical worlds, I fell into this community uh, kind of started by Bang on a Can, which is a composer's collective that has been around since the 70s. They, um, it's Michael Gordon, Julia Wolf, and David Lang, and they are incredible composers. They started their own ensemble that they write for, the Bang on a Can All-Stars, and over the last 40 years, I would say, 30, 40 years, have just been such a force in the creation of new music and also in the support and fostering of contemporary musicians and young people getting into this field. They run a summer institute called the Bang on a Can Summer Institute. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to participate in that in 2007 and 8. And then I interned in 2009 and couldn't get enough. Um, 
And through entering this community, um, that's how I met both Chris Marinetti and Joe Bergen many, many, many years ago, just through having worked with Bang on a Can and their various collaborators as well. Joe and I, um, very quickly after I had been to Bang on a Can, he'd already been, um, we started an ensemble together, Transit New Music. Um, I got to perform one of Chris's pieces in one of our earlier concerts. He'd written for an incredible violinist, Olivia de Prado, part of the Mivos Quartet, who we presented at the Anchorage um, Museum just a few years ago. Um, and I think that's when I first started, first met Chris too. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that's been so long. I hardly remember the day I met these guys. But anyway, um, I think it was actually at the Bang and I Can holiday party that Katie and Chris and I got to talking. And by that point, Chris had started this unbelievable organization, Found Sound Nation, which I highly, highly recommend everyone go check out. They have been doing just extraordinary work around the globe. Um, so Chris already being a, a self-starter, go-getter, like globally, globally thinking type person was like, yeah, what about Alaska? And we're like, yeah, what about it? And so we just started, we just had like one or two meetings just starting to brainstorm. And then this uh, National Park Service grant kind of came into our vision, our field of vision, the Beringia Shared Heritage Fund, I believe, or foundation. And um, yeah, the rest was history. So we knew we wanted to, um, you know, focus our work in Alaska with Alaskan artists and indigenous Alaskans as well. But in addition to that, um, kind of following suit with our mission to also um, work with or bring together some artists from New York. And Joe, not only uh, in addition to running his own fabulous percussion ensemble, Mantra, um, he's an incredible educator and has started a youth ensemble, Mantra Youth Percussion. Um, and we just thought, well, that would just be so perfect. And so we looped Joe in um, last year, I'd say. Yeah, and we've just been meeting ever since. I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, so I'll, I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> I could go on and on about how the last year or two has played out, but um, long story short, that's how it happened. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, so let's let's just kind of start to understand um, this project through its layers. Let's shift to Chris, if you will. And Chris, tell us um, about... Um, found Sound Nation and your interest in the, in this project and a little bit about the scope of it, if you will. Um, so I think, what did you say, Andy? You said about 10 years ago you guys started Wild Show. I think it was about the same for us. Although the seeds of what we were doing kind of had begun before that, um, I, I just, I found myself in the new music composition world. I was always, I'm a piano player, just um, an improviser. And um, my family was originally from Italy. So I went back to graduate school, school there. And I think it was there where I really felt the loneliest as a composer, I guess. And just what a sort of kind of solipsistic world that can be. And a very, um, a very insular and very, I mean, amazing community, but just, very focused on itself. And so I felt like when I moved to New York, I felt like I, I still wanted to involve that part of my brain and that part of my artistry, but to do something that affected, you know, a lot more people or people outside of that community. And I started a project in a school. It was, they didn't even have a school at that point. They had like an abandoned building because they were promised a school and they didn't have one. And, and this was a place in the Bronx. And I started a program there for a couple of years and it was really beautiful project. And several of those kids were, are still working with us on our staff now. Um, and that sort of that became what is Found Sound Nation. And I, I often describe it as almost like a, it's a collective, but it's also a production company in a sense. And I would say, you know, what we've been doing is producing not just media or films but producing experiences for people and producing opportunities for folks to connect with uh, their inner musicians or connect with their music maker inside of themselves and sometimes those opportunities are really short um, and sometimes those opportunities are longer like this Beringia project 
but that's essentially what we've been doing for the last 10 years. We've been running a music festival called One Beat with the Educational Cultural Affairs Department, which has been incredible and has allowed us to expand our team and our programming and work with artists at this point, I think from about 70 countries. Um, and yeah, and so that's Found Sound Nation. The other question was about Beringia, this Beringia project. Um, we're still at the very, like we're still researching and developing this. And I'm also, I also wish some of our native Alaskan partners were with us today. There's Yari Walker, especially who we've been working with. She is from, um, she's from Savunga, uh, St. Lawrence Island originally now living in Anchorage. Um, she's incredible and she's been a strong force in this project, but our idea is essentially to communicate the incredible place that is Beringia and the uniqueness of this region through science, through music, and through storytelling. And we're imagining now that the end result will be a film that also has a live score component. So it's a film that's performed with a live orchestra, chamber orchestra, uh, ensemble. And then there's a bunch of other kind of things that we're thinking to make along in the next couple of years. One of them that we've been talking to Yari lately about is a children's book about some of the stories from the region and from the other side of Beringia as well, the Russian side. Wonderful. So thank you so much for that um, background. Chris and and much, I know it's it's huge and background. and that's super exciting and I know that I mean this project is supported by the National Park Service and it's um it's big and we'll explore that a little bit more deeply but let's step over to Joe and um talk a little bit about um mantra percussion and youth mantra and the role that your organization has in this work. Thanks Asia. It's so great to be here. Um you know, first off, I'd, I'd like to say that it's really amazing um, to be working with Andy, Chris and Katie um, on this project, especially after having um, so many different, you know, Chris was talking about found sound and, and having all these experiential pieces. And I feel like uh, so many of my the most worthwhile exper musical experiences I've had in the last 12, 14 years of uh, playing um, contemporary music and playing in, in New York um, has been with uh, Chris, Andy and Katie. It's been it's been really cool. So um, joining forces together for this um, is uh, it's it's I, I know we're at the the very start of this, but um, you know, I can't, I can't wait to see what happens. Um, but but talking about mantra, um, so mantra is prime is it's a multifaceted organization. Um, it's mostly known, um, I, I think maybe to most new music circles and contemporary music circles as being a percussion sextet. Um, we most uh, we focus primarily on projects and music that deal with. Uh, singular works or experiences. So you come to a concert, you experience one single work by one composer. Um, uh, maybe maybe our best example of that is performing a piece by Michael Gordon, uh, one of the Bang on a Can uh, composers, um, who wrote a, uh, an hour-long piece for amplified two by fours. Um, I, I'm sure maybe uh, some people listening into this who are like, what would that sound like? Um, I'll be sure to send a link to that. Um, but the, that's maybe one of the pieces that we're most well known for playing. We've played it like probably close to a hundred times by now. It's a, we've been doing it for about 10 years. Um, but about seven years ago, um, we had the idea of, um, you, you know, we, we throughout some of our tours, we had, um, we had had a lot of fun working, uh, you know, at colleges, uh, doing like, uh, composer readings and things like that. And it was great, like interacting, um, you know, with students. We also did stuff at high schools. Uh, what we really wanted to do and what was really interesting to, to me especially was the idea of um, taking sort of like this professional experience and um, and devoting time and energy to developing like a single community. And um, from that idea came the idea of having Mantra Youth Percussion. Um, Mantra Youth is a tuition-free youth ensemble. I consider it sort of the, the teenage version of Mantra. We play some of the same pieces, um, but they also are starting to have their sort of own identity. Um, for one thing, um, we we have had Mantra Youth in residence in two different um, 
uh, urban uh, cities in New Jersey. Um, for four years, it was in Rahway, New Jersey, where I worked as a part-time teacher. Um, and starting next year, it's going to be um, in Newark, in the Newark public school system in Newark, New Jersey. Um, the uh, we primar uh, we've also sort of refocused the identity uh, from the start of the group where it had a lot to do with things that Mantra was doing. Now it really has its own identity. Um, they, they primarily focus on um, music by black, brown, indig indigenous, and people of color composers, uh, women identifying composers, and LGBTQIA uh, composers. Um, and, you know, you know I, th I think throughout all of this, um, what was most exciting um, for, for me in being in this project was uh, to sort of like my role to help facilitate a platform for Matra Youth Percussion um, to participate in this project in, in some meaningful way. And, and I think from that, um, like uh, sort of all these all these different uh, all these different projects that Matra Youth and Matra were working on, um, it kind of all came together in this last year. There were four um, really amazing um, percussionists from Matra Youth Percussion who had just graduated high school and they wanted to keep uh, performing. Um, so, so they actually started a group coming out of Mantra Youth Percussion. Um, they actually have uh, the, their own name now. I don't even know if I mentioned this uh, to the team yet, but um, coming out of Mantra Youth Percussion, their new group is called Recap. Um, they're still so, sort of under the Mantra Percussion umbrella, but um, I guess sort of the groundbreaking thing about this group is um, you know, it's it's sort of one of the only examples that I can think of in contemporary chamber music, um, where it's a group consisting of childhood friends that uh, wanted to to um, that sort of like came into their own playing contemporary classical music. So they're playing this very intense music without having any type of like conservatory or university training, which is, um, you, you know, I, I mean, I, I know for myself and Katie and Chris and Andy, we all sort of came from that background, um, you know, coming to new music through the college conservatory training. These are students that, you know, some of them I was teaching since like sixth and seventh grade, uh, coming into their own, um, wanting to do this and, and also doing it at a super high level, um, uh, something that that I, I think I think maybe you wouldn't sort of like expect to see, um, and you know I think uh, yeah yeah it, it's sort of something that's sort of really exciting uh, to me about about seeing like the next generation of musicians, um, you know being able to do uh, things at that level and also being able to do uh, interesting projects like this um, so something that deals with more than just playing music like interacting with musicians um, that come from different backgrounds, um, sort of giving a platform also for indigenous musicians to work with, um, uh, work with, uh, uh, you know, the, the members of Recap are Black and Hispanic. Um, so having a platform to have indigenous musicians work with Black and Hispanic musicians young up and coming musicians in a meaningful way. I think that's something that, um, you know, is going to definitely be celebrated and something that we're really excited about. Mm, fantastic. Thank you so much for that beautiful exposition of, of a really um, immense, impactful project. I'm moved by the idea of that mission to elevate young performers, to give them a stage without that conservatory training that, that you all share as leaders and visionaries in this kind of work. I'd love to just go back a minute to Wild Shore, to um, the, the, the sort of root or sort of mother tree of Alaska from which Wild Shore is just a really important and meaningful, um, <laughs> uh, you know, vibrant structure that has um, hooked Alaskan audiences into incredible music by emerging composers. And um, to thank Andy and Katie for the work that they're continuing to lead that began, you know, with Conrad Winslow, who also grew up in Homer. Um, I'm, I'm just sharing this um, image right now of, um, you know, Wild Shores, uh, um, whoops, there we go. Um, you know, a page on Wild Shore to kind of express to our viewers the scope of, um, you know, this this immense work. And, and also to talk about 
just briefly, Andy and Katie, what does it come back to for you? You have a con connection that goes back a long time ago, and it sort of reminds me of something that Joe just said, you know, young people before conservatory training getting passionate about music. And in, in what way does that directly relate to this project, this emergent project of which you are a part today? Well, I mean, I could just jump in. Andy and I have known each other since we were eight. I mean, we met neighbors on, on Marmot Hill Road in Fairbanks, you know, so, and it's it's a lot, uh, her and her family um, really gave a lot to me and encouraged me to um, to do music and to take flute lessons and study with Dorothy McQuain, who a lot of people know and, and love in the state. And so, you know, it, we've actually, we've been making music together in youth orchestra since we were little and at Fine Arts Camp at UAF. So, so I think so much of what Andy and I and Conrad, you know, we, there's so much, we, we identify so much of growing up in Alaska and, and what that community has given us and, and inspired us. And it's, it's, it's really a, a deep part of, of my identity. And I know it is for, for Andy and Conrad and, um, I think that was a lot of the reason why we we did come together and, and wanted to come back and start Wild Shores that we wanted we missed Alaska we'd all been away for quite some time I mean you know after we left for college and so it was a way for us to really return and it has grown so much I mean I it's I was just thinking about this before <clears throat> we started this conversation is you know how where we were in our lives then and where we are now and especially with COVID and everything it's really, uh, it's kind of amazing to kind of see how it's grown and what we were thinking before we started this. And now in this project and working with Joe um, and Chris with Found Sound Nation, I mean, these are, I would feel so lucky that they want to work with us. <laughs> I mean, they're just really inspiring what Joe is, just an amazing percussionist, but also an incredible educator and and um, has done, I've watched his groups and his youth groups perform and it's just, it's very inspiring and I can't wait for um, people in Alaska to see that and, 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 and to see them meet people in Alaska and artists and musicians there and work together and, and just, it's kind of like throwing them in a room and seeing what we can come up with. And Chris with Found Sound Nation, I mean, that a lot of what he's talking about with One Beat, this um, music festival they started, does a lot of that. You know, he has a, such a wonderful way of bringing these incredible musicians and people from all sorts of disciplines and diversity across the globe and the, just, um, you know, it's, it's almost more about the, you know, it's not just the music, it's also the relationships that we've developed along the way um, and these meaningful connections. And, and um, both Chris and Joe do that um, so much in their organizations and in their work. So, you know, I think this, that, and that's what this project really needs is, is developing those connections and over a, a long period of time. And I, I think it, um, with, with COVID, you know, it was, we were sad that we couldn't come up to Alaska, but we have kind of taken this time to really research and build relationships as we can over Zoom and meeting with Yari, um, you know, a couple times or bi-weekly as we've been doing. And so um, it, we're really in the beginning stages of this. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to go back to what you're talking about is, is uh, with Wildshore, um, yeah, I, um, it's just, it. I just, I, I love to kind of look back and see where we started and where we've come mm -hmm. and where we're, and where we're going to, where we want to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Andy, is there anything you would add? I'd love to, um, I'd like to, of course, echo everything that Katie just said. Um, 100%. Also just a quick side note for, um, you know, already being in the zoom and seeing so many, um, familiar faces and names is such a gift, but for those of, uh, for those of you who are tuning in and may not uh, know Katie and I and Chris and Joe, I just, for context, Katie and Chris and I all live in New York City um, and Joe lives in New Jersey. So this is all coming from quite far away. I, yeah, I would just say the, just speaking about like why Wild Shore, why there, why Homer, um, why Alaska, you know, for me also personally, it comes back to ideas of, identity. And as Katie mentioned, um, by the time Wild Shore was started, we had spent, both of us uh, had spent quite a lot of time away from Alaska. I think there was a period of time where there were three years where I didn't actually go to Alaska, not once. And 
I've just always felt very deeply that as, as, since I left at 18 to go to college in the, the lower 48 outside, um, that two of the two of the hallmarks of my identity were being a musician and being from Alaska. Personally, I started to feel like they were at odds with each other. Why did it why did a why did pursuing a career in music seem to be bringing me farther and farther away from my home and from Alaska? And especially when it's such a huge part of who I am and you know, I, I just thought there's got to be a way to bring it together because, you know, of all these experiences that we've that young Alaskan musicians had, um I I really think that one of, for me, one of the turning points where I really decided I wanted to go into music was on an outreach tour with the Arctic Chamber Orchestra, which is a branch of the Fairbanks Symphony Orchestra. And I was still in high school at the time. I was very lucky to be included. And we went and did this amazing outreach tour into very, very tiny communities in Alaska and Canada. And I'll just never, ever forget the specific moment of playing. We, would, we opened, we were in Car Cross, Canada, don't ask me to show it to you on a map because it's so small. I don't even know if I could find it again. And we opened our program, which was just going to be your standard classical music, whatever. We opened with the Canadian National Anthem. And um, the audience, the small but mighty audience, they just got to their feet and were weeping, just openly crying, had never heard um, Western classical instruments played live. They had never heard their anthem, their national anthem played live for them. And it was just really powerful. It was so powerful, just the power of music. Um, and also just the demonstration of all these unbelievable people in these communities that we never get to meet. And part of what Wild Shores want, you know, our mission is to celebrate Alaskan artists, to celebrate the community, to give back, as Katie's saying. And this goes hand in hand with the Beringia project as well, just bringing, helping to amplify voices, helping to bring attention to the incredible artists, incredible individuals and who, who live in our state or live on this land. Because <laughs> lest we forget, it has only been a state for a, a very short time in history. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Such, um, such good points and moving to to see and to hear about that long-term commitment to connecting across um, political borders, across geographic distances with with the um, small and mighty um, circumpolar audiences. So let's talk about um, Beringia for a minute. And also let's talk about the Indigenous advisors who are so central to this project. Um, while we're talking about Beringia, um, what I'd love is a is a project description from from one of you, and I'm going to um, click into my screen share again so that we can look at. Can you all see this map of Beringia? Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. Great. I just I just want to. Um, <laughs> be able to look at this while we're talking about this project description, a project that's apparently funded by the National Park Service. That's where I found this map, by the way. I thought that rather interesting. Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Yes. Um, so this is this is part of a, a National, Par uh, National Park Service project that funds work in this region. So um, when we first connected with the parks uh, department, uh, we were thrilled because they 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 funded a lot of um, th this program is I think almost over ten years old at this point uh, I think almost twice that and they've you know they funded an incredible amount of work in that area but um, they I think they were excited about what we were presenting them what Found Sound Nation was presenting them because what we were proposing was something that that had a lot of, um, you know, there were many deliverables, there were many things that we were, uh, outputs that we would share with people, you know, uh, books, films, um, workshops. But I think the idea to make something that, that really encapsulated the, as I was saying before, the uniqueness of this area and some of the, the both scientific work that's happened that's so incredibly important, not just to the region, but globally, 
uh, we, you know, some of Dr. Springer's work, I think, and uh, many others, um, but also some of the stories. I mean, they're incredible stories. Yari has regaled us with incredible stories and just an incredible perspective on the earth and on what it means to be a human, on what it means to be from, you know, that place and how we're all connected to that place in a way. So I think just finding a way, finding a form, really, I think that's what we're, we're really searching for now is finding forms for sharing these beautiful uh, ideas with people and stories with people. Um, so that, I think that's the main gist of the project. And, and in that process, we're going to connect with a, a lot of artists. We're going to connect with, you know, we've been, we've been working with Yari Walker. We've been working with Stephen Blanchett of Pamia, the amazing group up there based in Alaska. We've been working with Asi uh, Kaidarak, who is an incredible drummer and drum maker and leader of, of dances. And, uh, you know, some of which I've witnessed. We've traveled up to Nome to see some other incredible uh, drummers. So, yeah, so that, that's, I think, finding forms to share, to share this uh, with the rest of the world is what really excites me. And getting to collaborate with uh, as we've said before, with the amazing crew that we have, Joe, Andy, Katie, it's just a extra perk, you know, an amazing perk and amazing part of this because they bring so much to it. And, um, and it's, it's just nice to work with, it's nice to work with colleagues and people you, you love and think are great artists. So. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one thing that sounds really exciting to me that you're, you're, you've all been doing and building is this pretty phenomenal reading list as I understand it, it's a, whoops, did I just click myself into screen share by accident? I'm such a nut. Okay, here I am. It's a phenomenal reading list you created in Google. Um, and it's, you're structuring this with the advice of indigenous, um, you know, artists and researchers and so forth, doctors, um, Alan Springer, for example. I'd like to, um, to share that. I believe I've got it somewhere on my screen. I had it. Whoops. I'll find it in a second and then, then share it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how you, how you built this um, reading list. And um, there it is. Okay. I found it. Um, well, this, I would just say quickly, you know, this, this is inspired for, at least for me by a friend of ours, Adriel Lewis, who is uh, at the Smithsonian Museum. He's a curator and a friend and, I think when we when COVID happened and um, you know this coronavirus just limited our ability to travel and meet in person, which is making these bridges is so important. Um, we decided there must be you know we were thinking there must be something you know we want to still move the project forward. And you know after speaking with Adriel, I think one of the things that he really stressed was due diligence. You know, and really doing research and reading and really making sure to leave time for that due diligence and that work and that, uh, you know, those perspectives and that, uh, you know, that has already been, uh, that has already been written that is out there to, for that to sink in first. And so we really took on that, that kind of act and, you know, Joe and Katie and Andy and Yari were all excited about the idea of like a reading group and a discussion group. And so that's just what we've been doing the last six months is, you know, sharing readings and reading them and discussing them as a group. and we really welcome like if people have if people listening if people you know on the call have other ideas um for readings um in that area we really welcome that because we're trying to really cast a wide net and read as much as we can right now that's been written that's great i'm going to try sharing the um reading list again i think here it is right now um and I don't know if you want to share this really widely with, with our listeners, but it, this is a phenomenal um, document. And, you know, if you would, wouldn't mind, um, maybe Joe, anybody who would like to lead us, just kind of uh, give us a, a tour of this reading list. It's, it, it goes on for pages, but I see we start out with whales. <laughs> Are you muted, Joe? Oh, sorry. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Well, um, yeah. So, so actually, one of our most uh, recent readings was was about um, the bowhead bowheaded whale, and um, you, you know, I, I think maybe maybe I want to take a step back first and 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 say that in combination with the readings and speaking with people like Yari, um, you know, something that's been really eye opening about this project is um, learning directly from um, learning directly from people uh, from cultures from the people from those cultures who are allowing us to talk to them, allowing us to read their readings and, um, you know, in order to establish a deeper and more meaningful connection and collaboration. Um, you know, I know like, um, in, in the, there's been such a long standing practice, um, in, in certain parts of like us as Westerners taking something from a place and repurposing it or appropriating it and most likely profiting from it. I mean, it, it's ingrained in, in um, you, know, you know, parts of Western culture. Um, in percussion, for instance, um, so many of the iconic pieces that I learned in high school and college have so many problematic components of like appropriating instruments from other cultures and not really taking the time to learn of this, if this is right or wrong, not, not taking the time to like dive in deeper. So this process has been like really eye-opening um so you know just like as an example um we, we were uh researching about the nupiak people and humpback whales and um you know i i actually have this uh this quote ready um from the whitehead reading um which was a uh, modern nupiak uh oops, sorry <laughs> need to get back to that no um, modern nupiak whalers believe as they say their ancestors did that whales must be treated with respect and that the whale gives itself to a hunter who is deserving of the gift. Some captains say that the whale itself chooses the worthy captain, that the whale gives itself. Others explain the whale as a gift from God. So when I first read this, I wasn't, or when, when I was first tasked to read about um, humpback whales, I wasn't sure what kind of connections I would make that would resonate with me, but this was certainly one of them. And, um, you know, it's like one of these many instances that I help uh, that I think is going to help guide us in further discussions, um, which has been like, again, like I said, really, really eye opening, uh, you know, in, into sort of like diving in deeper and really understanding the culture, the people, the landscape, um, you know, everything that has to offer um, in order for us to make a more meaningful connection, not to just take it and run with it into a different direction. Mm. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this and there's, there's probably 70 titles on this list. And I, and I don't know if this is something that you want to share more broadly, but, it, but it's an incredible document, this, um, <laughs> this reading list. And um, I really, you know, applaud you for, for um, offering it it's, and for creating it together, for building your work on the basis of this kind of research. Anybody else want to add in um, about uh, what you're reading now and um, how you are connecting to, to sort of discuss and, and build um, this bigger project of Beringia based upon these readings? Um, I could just make a chime in just a little bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would like to thank Chris for really spearheading this document and rounding up uh, the majority of the initial articles and, and books and making them available to us. Um, you know, I think one thing that's been interesting, so right now, um, we, we started to notice some themes that were coming up. Um, one of the main ones, um, as Joe was mentioning, being whales. Um, and so we've been kind of priori prioritizing uh, reading about the cultural, well, at, like the Hal Whitehead book, The Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins. We also just finished reading um, this wonderful interview slash memoir of Harry Brower, who was um, a, among many, many things, a whaler. Um, in Utkiavik. And so it's it's been so interesting. Those two writings in particular, I think, really also explore kind of the relationship and, and I might even say bridge, which is also a little nod to the land bridge of Beringia that used to be there, but a bridge between like, you know, the indigenous cultures and their relationship to whales um, and modern Western science and its study of whales and 
how those two, I would say, like entities either work together or don't, or um, the sim like the similarities in like different ways of saying the same thing, I guess I would say, which is really, really interesting. Um, so right now, yeah, we're focusing on, on reading about whales, but there's so much more to keep reading about and educating ourselves on. Um, I will also just, I won't go on, but I will add one little shout out to my dad, Dr. Springer. And it's been really such a special uh, gift for us to get to um, come together in this way on this project and have him as an advisor and an author of these papers. I used to think that the only thing that the arts and sciences had in common was that we had to live uh, on writing grants. But there's more than that. So <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Um, Katie, tell us um, about how you guys are sort of connecting to process some of these readings. Are you, are you meeting on a monthly or uh, biweekly basis or how do you, how are you? Um... Yeah, I, I, we're, we, we keep, I would say biweekly, sometimes uh, once every three, three weeks, depending on schedule. Um, but I, I would, connecting, for me, I mean, what I really enjoyed about this is is coming together and and also reading these reading these readings and then discussing them with Yari and and that has been you know in some of these readings we've been we've been reading are of Yari's visions and her and her stories and um you know her energy is just it's it's really <laughs> It's just, you know, I don't know, like, it's, it's been, COVID has been so hard, you know, and I, I think I get so caught up in my, in, in the pain and, and suffering and, and of other people and, and, and my own thing. And it's so nice to come together with, and, and have these readings and read about and learn and then be with Yari and learn about Yari's experience and, and her, her talking about her visions. And, um, and that's been really meaningful um, for, for me. And, um, it also reminds me to kind of slow down and get outside my own head. And, and, um, so that, that has been really nice, um, for, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful, um, comment on just how important books and connecting, you know, in Zoom spaces and conversations, conversation spaces have been to sustaining, um, you know, individuals and communities in this time. Joe, would you um, talk a little bit more about um, something that you're reading or how you're connecting with, with Yari that's having, and, and of course also Stephen Blanchett and some of the other indigenous um, advisors that, that's having, um, you know, an impact on you as, as a maker of music. And you might need to unmute again there. Uh, it, it cut out a little bit, so I, I didn't hear the uh, the end of the question. <laughs> uh, it was just um, I'm asking about the um, the ways that you're connecting with some of these in indigenous advisors. Maybe talk a little bit too about Stephen Blanchett and and Aussie, and you know um, the impact that it has on you to to be connecting with these creatives. Well, well, you know, I, I think one thing, um, one thing about connecting uh, with with these artists and these writers is, um, you know, it, it gives. Uh, like, I, I think there's like a certain pressure that we feel as musicians, where you know we have to like present these things and come up with these things, and and uh, you know that are being presented in sort of like a live audience thing or, or whatever kind of content it's going to be. And, but with, with the research in this, I mean, even, even through, even though we've been doing this for months and months and, and, um, you know, reading different books and articles and talking about it, like we're in no way ex experts about any of this. And, you know, you know, I, I think, I think a part of this is that, you know, we're not, that's not really, um, like our jobs in this. To, to process that and, and put it out to the world. Like we have that connection when we're sitting down, um, you know, over Zoom and, and talking with people like Yari, they have like such incredible stories um, to tell, you know, story storytellers, um, you know, you know it, through different mediums, whether it's, whether it's writing or, or any type of like advocacy or projects that they've been doing. So I, I think more, more than anything else, something that's been really, um, 
really inspiring about this um, whole process, and I think that's probably going to help shape this further, is um, sort of like just our role to sort of help amplify the stories that they already have to share, um, right? The you know uh, so much of this is about um, is about advocating um, what's happening in this region, um, educating people from other regions and us helping facilitate that through um, through the stuff that, that that we've worked on before and and so using our skill sets for that but allowing them to sort of take the lead with um, you know what the narrative of this project is mm, thank you yeah so returning to Chris um, Chris you mentioned coming to Alaska that you've been here you've been able to um, visit um, during the course of this project and maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, a visitor visits that you've had and how you think this project will unfold over the next um, couple years because it sounds like it's a it's a it's a big it's a great big bridge well i'm originally from new mexico and the two times that i've visited have been in the dead of winter to Alaska. So. <laughs> great so you know that's that's a big adjustment for me um but no, I mean, they, they've been amazing. Uh, and I just want to echo what Joe said. I think like this is about building relationships and this is about, um, you know, really making those, those connections. And, I, and that's always the best part of this work is getting to having an opportunity to collaborate with people and hear their stories and find a way of, you know, facilitating artwork, making artwork together. I think that's what we have made our, you know, sort of that's what we dedicated much of our life and our artistry to doing. So that that has been great. We haven't we had a bunch of there were there were a bunch of plans this last year for um, several of the artists coming to New York, uh, several uh, you know our team going there and filming a few things uh, and uh, traveling up north. But those have been all put on hold. So. We'll have to see what is possible in the next year, I think. Um, but I, I guess I just want to say again, if, to look at the silver lining of this, um, the situation we find ourselves in a little bit, really, I think often when, when we're working on a creating something or using our art or using this, these experiences to find, to just get at truth, you know, is what artists can give to the world in, in a way, or like reveal truth or share, help share truth, facilitate truth. Like I, like that That's a value we have as artists. And I think often we're forced to work, like we're forced to, even with these grants and these commissions, like do that, you got five months, you got six months, do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, the stats, the thing. So having an opportunity now to really do what we, I, I think, should do in, every, in in any case and and really really dig in deeply on on you know this research i think has been really an incredible opportunity for us because it's given us a much longer period in which to really immerse and figure out how to do exactly what joe is saying is like facilitate the sharing of these beautiful already you know incredible stories and perspectives so yeah mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I'm excited that, you know, over the next couple of years, as your work, you know, in collaboration um, unfolds, we can reconvene again. We could bring in Yari Tuli Walker. We could bring in Stephen Blanchett. We can bring in Asi and others who may become more involved, maybe some of the writers or researchers, as you wish. That's a really important part of this forum that we're offering here through Banel. And also to our listeners. Great. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do fantastic. that. As we're kind of winding up this, we'll invite, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> as as, a, wants to come. <laughs> as we're winding up this hour, I just want to you know um, acknowledge our, our listeners from across Alaska and beyond um, to say you know if you've got questions for our featured guests today, we'd we'd sure love to um, offer you this this forum, um, and um, you know if not if there's um, comments from from our other featured guests, you know, in response to these um, ideas that Chris has just shared, they're more than welcome. You're, you're all more than welcome to speak up.
Well, if we don't have any big questions right now, we will look forward to our um, next gathering of this um, of this group um, around uh, around Beringia and continue to build this bridge. Thank you so much to um, Katie Cox and Andy Tanning from Wild Shore, Joe Bergen from Mantra um, Percussion, Mantra Youth, and Chris Marinetti from Found Sound Nation. You guys are doing incredible work out there, and, and it's, it's really exciting to see how deeply and completely um, you are sinking into this work during this time, and we look forward to, to supporting it and hearing more about it as it develops. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I had trouble unmuting, but I, we can't end this without a huge, huge thank you to Asia Freeman and Bunnell Street Art Center for being such an inspiration and a pillar of support um, of Wild Shore from the very first day. And we couldn't have done any of this without you. And also a huge thank you to the to the community in Homer and again all of all of our friends who joined us today. Um, shout out to Don and Carol Mears. Thank you for all you do. Um, again, none of this is possible without all of you. So thank you so much. You're here. Thanks everybody.